Well, good morning. If we haven't met yet, my name is Chris White. My husband, Dwayne, and I are the senior pastors here at The Bridge, and he sends his love this morning from Vegas. He and uh, our youngest daughter, Ashton, she's on fall break, are there. And Rachel, um, Rachel's ministering to the young adults there with a network church um, that's in Vegas. So they send their love this morning. But I am so excited because I get the honor and privilege of continuing our series on the greatest sermon. If you've um, been with us, you know we've been looking at one of Jesus' Many people say the greatest sermon that he ever preached. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. But the part that I'm going to share today, some people call, might say that it could be the Sermon on the A-Mount. You get it? Thank, thanks, Jordan. You're with me. I'm going to start in verse uh, 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. Say these things. There's a lot of things in there. And your heavenly Father knows that you do need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things, these things, shall be given to you as well. Let's read it in the message. This is a paraphrase. It says, if God gives so much attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen. Think about that. All the flowers on hills and fields that no eye even sees. God just does it because he's such a creator and an artist. He just flings them out there just because he's good like that. Don't you think he'll attend to you? take pride in you, do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. And here's the key. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Don't worry about missing out or don't fear what you're missing out on. So I'm going to title this part of the series, No FOMO today. No FOMO. And if you're wondering, I don't know what that is. Um, FOMO stands for fear of missing out. It's actually like a social media kind of phenomenon that that now with social media, you can see all these amazing things your friends are doing, and it actually creates anxiety that maybe you chose the wrong thing. You chose the wrong event, and there's this fear, there's this anxiety that I am going to miss out. Well, as we read our text today, we can see that as Jesus was speaking to people on the mountain, they had the same fear. They were afraid they were gonna miss out on the next meal. They were gonna miss out on having the clothes they needed. They were gonna miss out. And so they had to do all they can or all they could to get it themselves. And so Jesus wants us to reposition some of these things. Last week, if you remember, Pastor Dwayne talked about the Lord's Prayer. So we can see this transition in this, all of these things that Jesus is just sharing his heart with on this amazing message. And, and so he tells us about prayer. And now we keep moving in our scriptures and we see it in 6 verse 16 and um, all the way through to um, 17 and 18. Now he's going to talk about fasting. And he talks about having a heart and it actually, he keeps, Jesus keeps throwing in this father word to all these religious people who just want to obey all the rules and and do all of their to-do lists. And Jesus keeps throwing in this new upside down um, idea about relationship. Our father who art in heaven. And then he goes on and talks about fasting and he says, don't be like the hypocrites who they, they make it look like they're just suffering 
No, like they haven't eaten. I've been fasting for 30 days, and I'm, I'm, I'm just suffering for Jesus. And he said, no, don't be like that. It's between me, it's between me and you. It's if, you. if you do this, your father will reward you. It's between you and your father. And he keeps bringing in this aspect of relationship. So he's talked about prayer. And then he's talked about fasting. And then he gets to our scriptures that we're looking at today. And he's going to talk about giving. Prayer, fasting, and giving. But how Jesus introduces it is in this beautiful way of relationship where before we've been so worried of we're going to miss out on something. Now he's saying, if you really knew my father, you wouldn't be worrying about it. If you really knew his abundance, if you really could seek first his kingdom, you would really know how big his heart is, how good his heart is, and you would not have FOMO, that fear of missing out. This reminds me of a story I heard the other day that talks about value and what value we place on things because, you know, we're going to get to that the scripture where Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. There was a man who was on a business trip and he went to, he went to a shop like Macy's or some department store and he wanted, he went up to the, the counter and he told the, the clerk there, I want to buy my wife something to really show her how much I love her and appreciate her. And she was like, fantastic, I've got something special for you. And she brings out a big bottle of perfume. This is only $100. His eyes got really big. Um, you think maybe you got something a little smaller or a little um, not as expensive. Okay, no problem. She puts that back, brings out, you know, the same kind but a little smaller. This one is only $75, right? This is going to work. Um, maybe a little, a little smaller, a little smaller. Okay, she puts that back, brings out. Now, I know this one is going to be perfect. This one's perfect for you. It is only $20, and the man said, oh, man, can you show me something maybe that's cheaper? Do you have anything that's cheaper? And yes, and I have something just for you. And she brings out a big old mirror because she showed him, yes, I can show you something that's cheap. And it's you, sir. You treasure what you value most. I'm sure you've heard it said before, but if we took a look at all of your bank account today, you, we would see what you treasure, what you value. Your Amazon li wish list or your Amazon Prime account. Right now you can see that I value in my Amazon. I value that um, in April I'm going to have a grandson, if you didn't hear that. <laughs> Because I've been buying a lot of baby stuff. My husband is um, going to speak to me about that. But <laughs> you can tell where, what you value by what you spend your money on and also what you spend your thoughts on. You know, our world's value system is upside down. It doesn't look like the kingdom. Our world's value system, just this October, Forbes magazine came out with an article on one of the new richest Americans, self-made Americans. Do you know who it was? Kylie Jenner, age 21. It says her net worth, her value is now nearing $1 billion. Dollars. Nine hundred million dollars. Her sister Kim is only worth three hundred and fifty million. Now, when I say that, some of you are thinking that is so ridiculous, but can we can I just let you know what is the father's value of them? Because the father's value of them. How do we know that? Because value is determined on the price someone will pay. So actually, we think that is outrageous that they're worth that monetarily. But do you know what they were worth to the heart of God? They, they were priceless, just like you are. Because he sent his son Jesus 
to pay the ultimate price for them. So actually, the world may attach a monetary figure of net worth to us. Or maybe you're worth this because you have um, over 100 million Instagram followers. So you're worth this. But when we look into the eyes of the Father and into the kingdom, all of us are priceless because Jesus gave his life for us. Amen? True value. Value is an estimate or an assignment of worth. How much someone is willing to pay for it. You can see that in many of our thrift stores. My um, youngest daughter, Ashton, loves to shop at thrift stores. Her and Kelsey are so opposite. Kelsey would rather be at Neiman's or something, but Ashton loves thrift stores. My only problem with thrift stores is many times I'm like, I could buy this at Ross brand new for the same price. So, but Ashton loves vintage used things and she she really loves it so we went she was on break this week and we went to the thrift stores and it was it was so funny how all the things I was seeing that at one point people paid so much money for and now they cannot sell it at a thrift store in one corner there were all of these Disney VHS tapes any of you invest in all the Disney VHS tapes because someday they were going to be worth a lot of money. Do you remember our old Beanie Babies? Yes, when eBay had just come out, I told my husband, I think the Internet's a fad. It'll never last. But, you know, I remember eBay was all new and we were going to buy these Beanie Babies and it was going to set our kids up for college yeah, what at one point was going for $1,000, now you can't hardly give away. Maybe 10 All these old Wii, Nintendo Wii accessories. You remember when Guitar Hero came out? It was the hottest, newest Christmas present. I remember we got it for our kids. They were so excited. Now at a garage sale, that piece of, that accessory guitar, you can't hardly give to a two-year-old to play with. And... How about our um, digital apparatuses? I remember the day I got my old Razor flip phone. Anybody still have one today? We need to take up an offering right now. <laughs> um, Oh, man, I remember the day that I upgraded. And you remember when we had to text by pushing the button multiple times? Oh, what kind of world was that? My kids were so good. They could do it without even looking. They'd, they could do it under a table, and you'd never know they were even doing it. And I'm like, one, two, three. I'm so thankful for iPhones now. It, they still make fun of me that I text with one finger, but, you know, it is what it is. Value assigned worth. And how about how many junkyards do we have all around that kind of look like this? How many nights did people stay up losing sleep because they were worried about paying for that? Now it's a heap of rust, a heap of junk. And we keep reading in Matthew 6, 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The King James uses this word lay up. NIV says store up. What does that word mean? It means to amass to accumulate, or some people would say to hoard. Does anybody know any hoarders in your life? Don't, don't look at your neighbor. Don't look, at, don't look at your neighbor. Many of us have seen those shows on TV. One's called Buried Alive. And I think we have a picture of one episode where it featured twins named the Percy Twins. And they'd lived together all their, their life. And actually, just five years before this, 
their family because their house was condemned and when taken away from them, they came in and moved them out, set them up new and fresh. And five years later, they recreated the same thing again. You'll notice in the back corner, those white boxes, the sister said every day they go out shopping to get new stuff. And that is a new pancake griddle and a new crock pot. Because you can tell that you're cooking up a lot of stuff in there. I know, I, I know we're laughing, but it's really sad, isn't it? One of the, the sisters said, I really prefer not to be called a hoarder. I would rather be called a compulsive collector. Yeah. Well, I thought it would be funny to ask some of the staff and vision team uh, if, you know, if they had a temptation to hoard anything or, or if they had a fear of something run, of running out of something, what would it be? And um, I said uh, that my husband, it would probably be socks because he really likes to make sure he has socks. He said it would be time, but I'm still thinking it's socks. But Cody said he would hoard sleep, but then he said probably energy, which would mean Red Bulls. So Danielle said she would hoard bread and carbs. So... Um, Leonard said he'd hoard toilet paper. And LaDonna was scared to tell me, so I don't know what hers is. Mike Glisson said he'd hoard Oreos. I said I would probably hoard coffee, but, but then I really realized I would hoard dog food because I don't want Sir Winston to go hungry. And I really do, like, sometimes I'm like, oh, we're about to run out of dog food. What is that thing in your life that maybe causes panic, like, do we have enough? Are we going to run out? Sometimes that's like a, the trigger or a button or an alarm to go, okay, do I need to readjust some, some priorities today? What kind of hoarder are you? We have another picture here. <laughs> now, I'm not preaching against expensive tennis shoes. I'm just asking a question. Isn't it funny how when something's organized and not all messy, we say, that's not hoarding. That's just a collection. Actually, it's also funny because this picture was featured on an article about how tennis shoes are the new baseball cards. But I, have, but I do, I want to be very objective here. We could judge this picture, but God looks at the heart, right? Maybe we don't know that he, on the side, he buys these and collects these, and this is his business, and he sells it, and he supports missions. Or maybe he, he, he buys them. Someone's not believing me? <laughs> they ain't believing it. <laughs> it could happen. You know those extreme couponers that hoard up all the toothpaste? Maybe if you looked at their pantry, maybe it's because they're giving it to Bridging Hope. It could be. But what I want us to see here is where is the FOMO, the fear of missing out? Because God doesn't mind us having stuff if our stuff doesn't have us. What kind of hoarder are you? When Jesus was speaking uh, this Sermon on the Mount, many the people would have been familiar with stories of pharaohs buried in Egypt in the Valley of the Kings. And we have, a, we have a picture of that. Thousands of pharaohs buried with priceless treasure. Anybody seen Tomb Raider? You know, that this is what this is where these stories come from. And actually, it's interesting. I have a a quote here that actually 60 years before Christ, there was a Greek writer that visited the valley of the tombs and of the kings, and he said that he found nothing there except the results of pillage and destruction. 
they had amassed all, the pharaohs had amassed all this gold, all of these things to help them journey to another world. And then thieves came in and stole it. But some of you may know in 1922, there was a British archaeologist who found King Tut's tomb. An untouched tomb, four rooms of 5,000 articles of treasure. Some of it was even his childhood toys. I don't know why he thought he might need them in the afterworld, but they amassed and accumulated and stocked up and hoarded all these things. And they walked in and realized he could not take it with them. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. What kind of hoarder are you? Many times the test of our heart is if the Holy Spirit, we feel that little nudge and, and we, and, or that little thing where, where God says, could you give that? And we're like, uh-uh, I ain't giving that. That's a good test. That maybe something has our heart more than the value of the Father in his kingdom. But I know many of, many, we, we love our millennials, right? We love our young adults. So we, and you don't have to be a millennial to feel this way. It's so popular these days. We don't need big houses, right? We're going to live in a tiny house. Can you imagine? I, I mean, I just laugh at the thought of my husband and my dog living in a tiny house with his socks. <laughs> He's not here to defend himself. <laughs> He does have shoes too, but we do give them. They rotate. We give them a lot. But just think of, I mean, so many people say, I don't hoard. I don't amass. Do you know actually that the diamond industry, because of millennials, is taking a dive because they're like, I'll just wear plastic. I don't care. doesn't mean anything to me. But do you know that the heart, you can still be hoarding. Maybe you're hoarding food. I was a food hoarder. I grew up with a scarcity mentality that on Friday when we got a paycheck, we ate well. We're all going to Pizza Hut. You better eat it now because it's all going to be gone by Wednesday. So I hoarded it. I'd hide some so my sisters couldn't find it. Maybe you hoard time because you're afraid you're going to run out and you need all the time you can get to play video games and Fortnite and you need all the time to watch Netflix and you need all the time and if someone asks you to work in the nursery you're like I ain't got no time I'm hoard I'm hoarding up the time maybe you're hoarding your talent you might not be hoarding stuff and material stuff but maybe you have so much potential you have a voice like an angel you have so you can draw you you have all these creative thoughts, but you've locked it up, hoarded it up, vaulted it up, and said, I'm afraid. What if someone doesn't like it? Maybe you're hoarding up emotions and feelings because what if I shared how I felt about someone? Maybe what if I complimented them and they didn't return it? Or what if they reject me? What if, what if I show them kindness and they're mean to me? And so you hoard up all your feelings. My closed book, I'm not going to share love with you. I better hoard it to myself because you might take it from me. Maybe you hoard trust because you can never trust anyone but yourself. The lie is if I can hold on to it tight enough, if I can get all I can and can all I can get, I have control of it. But we know that that's a lie because Jesus said you only find your life when you lose it. Let's read in Matthew, continue in Matthew 6, through 24. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, or the King James says good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy or bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, when we read this in our culture, we think, oh, he's just talking about darkness and blindness. But because we don't understand, this is actually an idiom in, he in Hebrew culture that if you have a bad eye, that meant you're stingy. 
If you have a good eye, that means you're generous. And so Jesus is here sharing, if you're an open, generous person and you have a good eye, then light, you are letting light come out of you to bless others. And light is going in you because that's who the Father is. He is a good, generous, giving God. And when we are representing him and we are being in relationship with him, then we won't be stingy. We're going to be generous. And then it goes on in verse 24 to say, no one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. What is the master? It's the person in charge. It's the person who's giving the orders. The person who work, you work for, we will either be mastered by God and make money our servant, or we will be mastered by money and try to make God our slave. The question is, who will be first? Who will have first priority? That priority means that whoever that servant is, money or God, they have the power they have the power to make decisions. They have the power to take your thoughts. It would be interesting if we t- took an inventory of our thoughts and the things that we worried about all week. How many of them have to do with money? How many of them have to do with things? How many, and we're going to talk more about worry in just a minute. Who has the power? What gives identity? Identity. What gives me security and worth? And who has the deciding vote? Many times you know God's called you to do something, but then we say, but I don't have the money. Who then has had the deciding vote? Right then, money has made the decision. Even though you didn't know, God had, you couldn't see it because it took faith. But down the line, God was going to make a way. But you let money talk you out of your destiny because you didn't see it today. Bridge, hear my heart. We, I believe in you so much. I believe in what God has called us to be and how God has called us to bless this city and the nations of the earth. So I believe we can get beyond this FOMO, this fear of missing out, because the devil will make us fear one of two ways. One way is, Uh, that you give, your priorities are wrong, and you work all the time, and you never lay up treasures in heaven. You never give. It's all about what I can get now, and you miss out because you're afraid of missing out. Or the other side is, and I want you to hear me because I believe this is so many of us. You're actually afraid to make money. Mic drop. Because what would it do to me? Money has no power except what we give it. It's a tool. And I'm, Bridge, hear me today. There are people that need us to help them go to a new level, to help them break into freedom, to help them get get off of drugs. There are churches that need to be planted in other nations. There are all these amazing things God has called us to do, to build a community center in the middle of our city, in the heart of our city. But you know what? He's going to use you and me. That means that those funds, they're not going to rain out of the sky. They may come from a grant or God may, but you know what? He wants us all to participate. So to do that, he is going to bless you and bless your bank account and bless your business and bless what you set your hands to do so that he can get it to you so he can get it through you. Can we get over the fear of having something because it doesn't look spiritual or it doesn't look holy or what will it do? If we're seeking first the kingdom, seeking first the kingdom, I want you to remember, well, let me tell you this and then I will show you. God wants our joy to be in him so so that he can give us things to enjoy, but our joy is in him. If we focus on our standard of giving, God will increase our standard of living. But our part is the giving. 
our part is the Father's heart. Our part is being able to let go and let it flow. Amen? He wants to, he wants to bless you. But it's in the priority, in season, and knowing this is the right time. This is from the hand of God. And I want you to always to remember this picture. If we are receiving, it's like our heart is receiving like we're receiving it from heaven. We're receiving a gift from the Father because, you know, the Bible says that, that he's a good father. And if our earthly fathers want to bless us and give us gifts, good things, how much more does our heavenly father want to, right? It's not an issue of he's mean and bad and he doesn't want you to have nice stuff, right? But he wants, just like our kids, we, we want them to have a generous heart and be, be willing to share, so are you in a receiving posture or are you in a, po- a getting, manipulating? That's FOMO. I'm fear of missing out. So I'm going to borrow it today. I'm going to steal it today. I'm going to take all that I can and I better look out for myself and make this happen for myself because of fear of will God really do it for me? And that leads us to our next part that Jesus leads into worry. This is how we can trust God and not fear missing out. And he starts, we're going to read in Matthew 6, 26, but he starts here with a command, do not worry. He's not giving us a suggestion. It's not um, a helpful tip. It's not a little TED talk. Jesus is telling them, if you knew the Father's heart, I'm just telling you, I'm setting this up, do not worry. That word worry there in the Greek is, it means anxiety. It means to be divided and to pulled in opposite directions or choked. Can I get a witness? Anybody ever felt that? Doesn't that feel like what worry feels like? Matthew 6, 26 and 27 says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. There is creation, and this is the key. Are you not more valuable than they? Did God send Jesus to die for all the birds and all the wildflowers? No. You are his child. You are his priceless creation. So if he cares for, I love birds. I, I'm, I'm like a bird lady. I, I'm always like, oh, red bird, Jesus, Jesus, he's speaking to me. It's just like our thing. I, I see it. Oh, I got to tell you this. This morning I was getting my notes ready, and all of a sudden I heard this on the window, like a rock. It sounded like a rock. Bang, bang. And I got up from my computer, and I walked in. Um, to where the sound was coming from. And did you see the sunrise this morning? It was the, I think it's for Mariah's birthday. It was God's little gift to her. Hot pink all around the most beautiful canvas painter. And I don't know what the rocks, I don't know why the sound, but it was just like God was saying, Chris, come here, I want to show you something. Come here, look, look what I did. And I just gave him, a, I said, God, I'm giving you a hand. Lord, you, you need a hand. Because that is awesome. If he can do that, if he cares for the birds, how much more does he care about you? How much more? What do we worry about? Let me just tell you this real quick. An average person's anxiety is focused on 40% of things that will never happen. So 40, almost half of everything you worry about never going to happen. 30% things about the past that can't be changed. So that's, we're up to 70% there that's worthless. 12% things about criticism by others, mostly untrue. 10% about your health, which actually makes you more stressful and adds more worry. 8% is about real problems that can be faced. 8%. 
can I challenge us this morning to turn all that anxiety, that worry? I, I love how the, the commentary of Matthew Henry says that worry is a disquieting, tor tormenting thought which hurries the mind here and there. It hangs it in suspense. It disrupts our joy with God and dims our hope in him. It makes us sleep less and hinders our enjoyment of others, of our friends, and of what God has given us. Oswald Chambers said, all our fret and worry are caused because we're calculating without God. So that 8% of actual things that are real problems don't need to be worried about. We can turn it into worship. We can turn it into a prayer when we put the Father in the equation. What kind of hoarder are you? The worship team's coming. But we're all called to be hoarders. Jesus said, lay up for yourselves, not treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. You know heaven is real. And many of us have experienced this. We've had many, many close people that have actually graduated to heaven this year. And right now you can pray for my dad. He, he's in stage four cancer and we're, we're believing for a miracle. This week on Wednesday, he's supposed to have a surgery. We're believing the doctors can do things right, but they said one little thing that's off and it could mean his life. The doctors say, if it works, he'll have three more months. You know, when you get to that place, heaven, if Jesus is in your heart and, you, and Jesus is your master, and you've lived your life hoarding up things in heaven, death isn't near as scary. Because you know eternal, we are living a temporary earthly existence. It's like that. It's like a blink. It's just like a drop in the ocean. And then there's eternity. And everything, whenever we, we shift, shift our focus to what's, the, what's on the Father's heart? What is he saying to give? Oh, you, okay, Lord, I'm going to let that flow through me. I'm going to bless that person. Um, and then you get bigger. And your storehouse gets bigger. And abundance gets bigger. And, you, and you're, you're not afraid to tell people, you know what, I think you're awesome. I, I have you, do you know about Jesus? And you're not afraid to love them. You're not afraid to share your faith because you are hoarding things in heaven. True value. This morning, what things take up your thoughts? What things are you focused on that have eternal true value? And I want to finish our time this morning with a story you know, I, I grew up on a farm, so you can imagine that I did watch my share of Little House on the Prairie. Some of you may not know what that is. You do if you have reruns, but it was about a little, a sweet little family on the farm, and Charles loved his family, and they didn't have a lot of money, but they loved each other, and, and you know, they, they were doing, they were getting by, and and they loved God, but one day they got word that Charles, or Paul, the dad, he had an inherited a fortune. Inherited. One of his long lost relatives had died and he had inherited this fortune. So all these dreams come alive in them and everybody has a plan for what to do with the money. And they go to the the mercantile and, you know, the wealthy Mrs. Mr. Mrs. Olson. And they borrow money for new farm equipment and to update the farm. And, and they extend themselves past where they should, knowing it's coming any day. It's coming any day. And so finally the day comes. And they put the big old box on the table. And they're going to see all of the massive wealth they've just suddenly dropped into their lap and they open the lid and little Laura, she was, you know, she's only about eight years old. She sees all of this cash and she starts jumping up and down. We're rich, we're rich, we're so excited. Except she looks at her paw in his face. It's just sunken. Can you guess? There was a lot of money, but it was Confederate money, which meant 
it was worthless. Later on in the show, it shows little Laura wallpapered her clubhouse with all of their cash. Many nations have actually done this when Cody was sharing with me, his teacher talked about in Poland, whenever the economy crashed and, and or maybe even when they came into the EU and their old money, what kept people up at night, what people would have killed for, what people would have left their wife for, what people worked all of their time and ignored their children for, in one day crashes and then they use it for wallpaper. One of these days, all of us, we will meet Jesus and there, there will be a judgment day. But that judgment day does not have to be some big scary thing where we feel like God's gonna hit us over the head. Actually, judgment day is like our award ceremony. It's the day where when you've let Jesus be your master, when you have been seeking first the kingdom of God, when you know I've sent more ahead of me than I kept here. Hmm. My inheritance is in heaven, and it's sure. My master, our Lord, is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the ancient of days. He is the one who sets the value. And I just want to ask you today, if you would just stand with me. I'm reminded of Psalm 27 where David said, this one thing I seek. What's your one thing today? Maybe, maybe you, you know you love Jesus. You know, I want to serve God. I want to bless missionaries. I want to do all of these great things. But maybe you've just got distracted. And right now, I'm just throwing a rock on your window saying, look up. There's something so much bigger. There's something so much greater than what we can amass and what we can accumulate. And, and the stuff that in 10 years will mean nothing. Hmm. You can invest your life in something that has a sure reward, something that has an eternal reward. And you may not see it today. You may say, I, no one knows when I, when I call and encourage this person. No one knows when I, when I greet or when I help in the parking lot or when I give. No one knows, but God sees. You are storing, you're a heaven hoarder. You're storing up treasures in heaven. We're gonna sing this one more time. And I believe there is someone in this room that you know today is the day you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, the master of your heart. And today is a turning point day where you serve him. And he can welcome you into the beginning of your eternity. It's a sure thing. It's a sure, it's a sure thing because he loves you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing this and make this the heart cry today. Jesus. For we trust in our God and through his unfailing love we will not be shaken. We will not be shaken.